next to Ryan. Yep, up at the top. Once it gets to our part, I'll probably just move over and take control later. Okay. So, thank you. What's that, huh? <laughs> I, I stopped turning right at the sign. Sounds good. I'll okay. let, let David know to let everybody know. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, July 22nd uh, Indianapolis Marion County Audit Committee. Uh, thank you all for being here today. My name is uh, David Reynolds, and I am the um, chairman of the um, City County Audit Committee. And once again, it's great to have uh, everybody here to um, receive the uh, Indianapolis and Marion County um, annual financial reports and that that'll be the focus of today's meeting so with that i think we'll go ahead and um, start with introductions if you will start with committee members uh, tanya please hello everyone my name is tanya ng and i own my own business the organizer Um, I'm Mike Clater, member of the committee, and trying to stay retired, and people keep dragging me into stuff. 
My name is Crystal Allen, also a member of the committee, and I'm trying to drag people like him out of retirement to join my firm, uh, Total Solution CPA and Consulting, uh, on the east side of Indianapolis. Good morning. My name is Michael Paul Hart, and I'm an Indianapolis City County Councilor that represents District 18. Mike, you never heard the saying, once in, never out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Julie Voorhees, Marion County Auditor. Ryan Mann, Special Counsel in the Mayor's Office. Sarah Reardon from the Bond Bank. Good morning, I'm Susan Gordon with the State Board of Accounts. Good morning, I'm Gary Ricks with the Office of Corporation Counsel. Eva Flick here on behalf of Brandon Herget, CFO of the Council. Uh, Nicholas Ackerman, Financial Reporting Manager with the OFM. Good morning, um, I'm Janae Roten. I'm a Deputy Controller with the Office of Finance and Management. Good morning, I'm Rodney Shine. I'm Chief Deputy with the Marion County Treasurer's Office. Sarah Twining, Senior Manager with Forvis. Caroline Spidal, Manager with Forvis. Willie Brown, account staff with uh, Thomas and Reed. Emily Tercy, director with Forvis. Andy Renzel, partner with Forvis Public Sector Group. Rick Wickren, partner with Forvis. Wesley Jones, deputy director of OAP. Good morning, Joe Glass, director, Office of Audit and Performance. Good morning, I'm Vivian Agnew, performance consultant with the Office of Audit and Performance. No. Tion Trice, Auditor with the Office of Audit and Performance. Vanessa Mitchell, Office of Audit and Performance. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, taking the time to let everybody know. F a few housekeeping things. Um, do remember that we are being uh, videotaped, and so anytime you speak, if you would use your uh, toggle switch to turn the mic on and off, that would be appreciated. Um, and um, everyone should have at their um, desk a paper copy of both uh, financial reports. Um, we will get an electronic copy in, in the very near future, so if you would prefer not to take the paper, I'm told you can just leave them here and, and they'll collect them and reuse them in another way, but, and, but we will be getting electronic copies at a later date, but feel free to take the paper copies if you like as well. Um, first order of business is the approval of the um, April 22nd, 2022 Audit Committee meet, minute, meet, me, meeting minutes. Apologize, sorry about that. Um, those were sent out in advance of, the, of today's meeting. Are there any um, corrections, edits, or comments from committee members? Hearing none, is there a motion on the minutes, please? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed the same? Very good. Um, I would remind the members that the uh, next meeting is um, scheduled for Friday, October 28th, 2022 at 9 a.m. here at the um, City County Building. And that um, after today's meeting, watch for an email. There will be a survey of committee members um, on the um, post-external audit survey. And so if you would participate in that survey, that'd be greatly appreciated. So watch your emails, please. And with that, I believe I'm turning it over to uh, Rick uh, to start us off.
Ah, there we go. Thank you. Technology's already getting the best of me. I apologize. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Again, my name is Rick Wicker, and I'm a partner with uh, Forvis. I almost said BKD because Forvis is still relatively new, and, and that's one of the things we'll talk about today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And first thing I might just start with is, you know, you obviously got a lot of paper put in front of you today. We sincerely apologize. What you're going to find is that one of the keys to the audit process is making sure that we have all the information we need to opine on the, the city's financial statements. And a piece of that is the Indianapolis Housing Agency. Indianapolis Housing Agency is audited by other auditors. They've had their fair share challenges, admittedly. And we actually just received their final audited financial statements on Wednesday at about 5.15. So it wasn't until um, really very recently in the last 24 hours that we were able to get the city's financial report finalized because we have to hold our report until the discreetly presented component unit of the housing agency is complete. So again, I apologize for dropping this much paper on you. What our goal today is really to go through and give you a summary of the audit process and audit results as well as some financial information for both the city and the county. I won't go back through introductions. This shows our team. Um, Willie introduced himself. Willie is with Thomas and Reed, who is our MBE participant for the city and county audit. You'll see he kind of touches all four aspects of these audits, so we're very pleased to have him, and you'll hear from him uh, here a little bit uh, later this morning. To talk a little bit about Forvis, if you're aware, up until June 1st, we were BKD, and we've been BKD for about 21 years. Effective June 1, we merged with a firm called Dixon Hughes and Goodman, or DHG. Uh, as I mentioned, that, that became effective June 1, but it actually, the process started several, several months ago, and it's probably been in discussions for several years, candidly. Uh, DHG is a, a firm very, very similar to BKD. We were about the 14th largest firm in the country. DHG was about the 17th largest firm in the country. Uh, very few overlapping geographies, and so very similar mindset to how we serve clients, the clients we serve, and so forth. And, and what this resulted is in a merger of equals, that uh, created Forvis. Forvis stands for Forward Vision. Um, together, we're the eighth largest firm in the country with over 530 partners and 5,400 employees. We have reach from coast to coast and 69 markets, and our total revenues are estimated to be 1.4 billion. So, very exciting for us. And, and candidly, you know, as I speak about what made me vote for this, which the support from both partner groups was overwhelmingly positive. I kind of break it, broke it down into three areas. You know, what does it mean for me? Well, it means I keep to keep, get to keep serving the great clients that I've served for a number of years. Uh, it means great opportunities for our people, better benefits, um, better opportunities to move if they want to geographically relocate and what have you. And for our clients, it means we can do more for them. And so ultimately, this was really a no-brainer from, from my standpoint as I voted affirmatively for this. For this. What does it mean to you? Um, you still see the same engagement team, I think, if you were to ask. The staff, they probably haven't really noticed a difference other than the name, the email addresses from which they receive our information. We have the exact same focus on unmatched client service and unmatched client experiences. Um, we believe this is going to position us to attract and retain top talent, something we're very, very excited about. Um, obviously, we're still focused on innovation and, and specialized solutions, and, and I think our thought leadership, which is something we've always prided ourselves on, is only going to get better because of these opportunities. Our objectives for today, um, as I mentioned at the opening of my comments, is just to really provide a summary of the audited financial statements, the audit process, the financial results. We'll cover the required communications for both the city and the county. One of the key things we want to make sure we do is answer any questions that you may have. Um, so obviously, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to stop us. Uh, as much as this can be a dialogue, we're happy to have this be interactive. Uh, and then obviously review the results of the single audits or those federal grant audits. This is really just an index, an overview of those slides, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. Instead, I'll kick it over to Andy, who'll start covering uh, the content of our presentation. Thank you. Perfect. Th thanks, Rick. And, and again, I'm just going to spend a couple minutes and remind um, the, the committee really of the responsibility for the audit from both Forbes's perspective and aspect as well as city county management. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the scope and, and what does the audit exactly mean um, but as a reminder for you all. So again, management, management's responsibility is for the overall um, preparation and presentation of the financial statements. Um, so that is not our responsibility um, as well as management's responsibility to design an internal control structure and maintain an internal control structure to both protect the assets of, of both city and county um, and ensure that, that you all um, and the public receives 
um, accurate financial reporting. So again, that is management's responsibility. And then as we move on to Forbes's responsibility, or our responsibility as auditors, is to opine on uh, the fairness of the financial statements prepared um, in the ACFRs that you have, the annual comprehensive financial reports that, that you all have, um, that they're free of material misstatement. Again, we, we do our audit in accordance with a number of auditing standards, generally accepted auditing standards, which is kind of the core uh, principles that, that guide how audits are performed, um, but then you're also subject to government auditing standards, which is kind of one more uh, level, if you will, or layer of, of audit procedures that um, you're subject to. Um, as a result of your federal spending, you're subject to uniform guidance. Um, again, both city and county spend um, significant federal dollars on an annual basis, so you're subject to uh, uniform guidance procedures or uniform guidance audits, which uh, again is really the, the requirements for how you spend federal dollars, both on control side and compliance side. And then finally, we follow the uniform gu compliance guidelines issued by the State Board of Accounts. Um, so you are subject to their uh, purview and, and oversight. So we have uh, procedures that we build in to um, audit in accordance with their guidelines as well. As a reminder, we do not test every transaction. Um, so we evaluate risks, we evaluate control risks and inherent risks and design our audit procedures um, really on, an, in, on a risk-based approach. Um, so not, not only size driven on, on balances, but, but where does the risk lie for both city and county? And they are evaluated separately. So we talk about city and county, but as a reminder, you do get a separate audit report for the city and a separate audit report for the county, um, as they are uh, still technically uh, legal, legal separate entities. The scope of the audits, um, again, we do issue, or, or we opine on two separate ACFRs, or annual comprehensive financial reports that you issue, or the city uh, management team issues. Um, and they're really broken down into three sections. The, the financial section, that's kind of the middle, or the, the meat of each of your documents is what we opine on, so it includes all of the financial schedules, um, your statement of financial position, your statement of activities, cash flows where appropriate, um, and all your footnotes that are, are, again, substantial. The introductory section in the very front, and the statistical section in the very back are unaudited, um, but we do review those. They're, they're part of your filings with uh, the GFOA that we'll talk about here in just a second. Um, but we do review those requirement, the, those sections, the introductory and statistical sections um, for reasonableness to make sure there's no um, errors as it relates to the financial statements. The third item you see on here, the GFOA, which is the Government Financial Officers Association, um, you did receive their kind of highest um, benchmark for financial reporting, again, for 2020. Um, so both city and county um, received that financial reporting award um, from the GFOA um, here in 2021 for the 2020 um, filings that, that were completed. Again, our, our, we do issue separate opinions on the financial, the overall governmental financial activities, the fund level financial activities, and then the other aggregate um, for, again, both city and county. So each of your reports contains um, several opinions, if you will, on each of those significant pieces of your uh, financial statements. And then lastly, you do get a, in relation to opinion, on certain supplementary information, which basically means that, that we review those as it relates to the, the core financial statements um, and issue an opinion of, of that in relation to. The last piece on the scopes, uh, Rick talked about this just a little bit, but component units is kind of the terminology in the government world for entities that are related to you enough that they need to be reported as part of your financial reporting system. Um, so the Indiana housing, Indianapolis Housing Agency, IHA, that, that Rick mentioned, is a fairly significant discreetly presented component unit. Um, they do have separate auditors, as, as Rick mentioned, so we do not uh, opine on that, but, but do bring those, those audited numbers into the city's financial statements um, as, as is required by their, the standard setting bodies. Um, the Circle Area Community Development Center, or the CAC, is a blended component unit. And when we say blended and discreetly presented, maybe um, discreetly presented means they, they really have their own columns in the city's financial report. Um, blended means they're, they're really essentially rolled into the financial statements of the city. So they, you, if you picked up the financial statements, you won't see a column labeled a CAC or Circle Area Community Development Corporation because those numbers are really just rolled into uh, the general activities of the, of, of the city. And then lastly, the county currently does not have any component units. Um, so there's no additional separate legal entities that are rolled into the county report like there are for the city. With that, we're gonna start talking about the specific kind of results for both city and county, and I'm gonna turn it over to Emily to, to start that process. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Um, and I appreciate you keeping us moving and, and moving. I do wanna make sure that we pause periodically to make sure that if there's any questions. I'm, I'm assuming as the discussion is going on that we can interrupt if there's questions and whatnot. So committee members, please feel free to 
interrupt, raise your hand or something as if there's something that uh, you need uh, further clarity on or, or don't quite understand. Thank you. Any questions at this point? All right, thank you, Emily. Okay, great. Well, I'll go ahead and dive into the audit results um, for the current year. So as you'll see on the slide here, we have a column for the city as well as the county. And when we look at first the opinion over the financial statements and other supplementary information, we issued an unmodified or clean opinion on both the city and the county. Um, this is what you should expect to see and what you want to see each year in your audit results over your financial statements. For the city, IHA also did have an unmodified or clean opinion. Again, just wanna point out that we do not provide that opinion that is provided by other auditors. Then if we look at governmental auditing standards, and first wanna focus on the city side here. So if we look at internal control over financial reporting, I wanted to highlight that there were no reportable matters that were included in the results of the audit for the city this year. Um, one to highlight that really, because this is the first year that there has not been any reportable findings included in the city report for, for a number of years. Um, so really wanna commend the city side for having um, clean audit results and no reportable findings over internal control for financial reporting in the current year. So, um, and then no material non-compliance for the city. If we look at the county, we do have two significant deficiencies that were included for internal control over financial reporting. We will go through those findings here um, in some slides that are later on, so we'll touch on what those two items are. Um, but no items of material non-compliance for the county. And then last, if we look at the uniform guidance standards um, for internal control over compliance, we had no findings reported for either the city or county in those results. So again, very clean results there. On slide 12 here, here is where we really start to summarize what is some of our required communication um, to the committee and management. Um, as Andy kind of alluded to earlier, our responsibilities are to provide reasonable, um, not absolute assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. This means we use scoping and sampling techniques to really focus on those high dollar value or high risk areas of the financial statements. And then the last bullet here is that our audit does not relieve management or those charged with governance of their overall responsibility um, for the preparation of the financial statements. Here on slide 13, you'll see a listing of areas where judgment or accounting estimates are used in the financial statements. This means there's an area of unknown or uncertainty incorporated into the calculation or determination of these amounts. So you'll see here on the list, for instance, the allowance for uncollectible receivable, the depreciable lives of capital assets, um, or the actuarial assumptions that are used in the determination of the net pension liabilities or post-employment benefit obligations. Each of these areas that's listed on here is consistent with where the city and county have used judgment or accounting estimates in the past in their financial statements. So there's nothing new presented here. There's not any new areas where they're incorporating judgment or accounting estimates in the current year. Slide 14 is gonna include a listing of those significant financial statement disclosures. And we have a column both for the city and county and point you directly to the note in the financial statements. Um, we consider these significant financial statement disclosures just due to the overall either significance of the balance, so the overall materiality or the volume of transactions flowing through, or due to the amount of accounting estimates or judgments that are used in their determination. Um, so I know these the financial statements are large documents, so these are really the footnotes that we would ultimately point your attention to if you only had a little bit of time to look at the financial statements. Each of those footnotes are consistent with ones that we've identified as significant or sensitive in the past. So there's, there's nothing new included on this list um, compared to the prior year. Okay, if we look at the next slide, slide 15, this is going to include the audit adjustments that were either proposed and posted or ones that were, were not recorded. If we first look at the city, we did have one audit adjustment to adjust accounts payable and record some additional accruals there. Um, that adjustment was only around $400,000, so not 
very significant to the financial statements as a whole for the city. On the county side, we did have two adjustments. First was one um, to reconcile cash, uh, which was just over 700000 and then we had a, another adjustment to record um, the sheriff pension contribution payable, which when we look at the findings here, uh, a little bit later in the slide, you'll see those significant deficiencies on the county side really relate to kind of these two adjustments that were, were posted. And then lastly, at the last bullet there, we do have some items that either the city or county um, or Forvis identified during the audit process that we determine are not material to the overall financial statements um, and so are not recorded or posted in the financial statements. Those have to be accumulated though and included on a listing that gets issued with our final deliverables. A summary of those past adjustments is included in this presentation. Um, it's gonna be found on pages 53 through 70. Um, we're not gonna go through those specifically but though that listing really accumulates all of those adjustments that we've identified and determined are not material to the overall financial statements so are not recorded or reflected um, in the financial statements that were issued. If we look at page 16, the first three bullets here as far as disagreements with management, consultations with other accountants or significant issues discussed with management during the audit process, we did not have any matters to note or to communicate to the committee in those three areas. As far as difficulties encountered in performing the audit, um, as we've alluded to earlier, we did have some issues or delays in obtaining the information or the audited financial statements from the IHA audit. Um, so as Rick mentioned, we just issued the city financials this week, which normally our goal is to issue those before uh, June 30th, but because of the delay on their side and not being able to finalize their report until Wednesday, we were not able to issue the city's financial statements until um, this past, or yesterday actually. So um, we did have some delays there. As far as getting everything from the city and county, we received excellent cooperation from all of the staff here and had all of our work wrapped up on both the city and county side done before 6.30. So again, really appreciate um, all the departments that help us at the city and county, specifically OFM, OAP, the auditor and treasurer's office. So again, really excellent cooperation from all of those groups and appreciate all of their help in the audit process. Okay, if we look at the next slide, slide 17, um, as far as other written communications, um, at the end of the audit engagement, we do have management sign um, the management representation letter, um, which is basically a test, management is attesting that they have provided us everything and not withheld any information during our audit process. Um, so that does get signed at the end of the audit engagement and, and is included with the final deliverables. And then as well too, we also issue internal control letters and management letters, which, which you guys have copies of in front of you. Um, these include some of the, the findings that we found during the audit or any recommendations or suggestions that we have. Um, and we'll go through some of the, air, the items that are included in those letters here a little bit later on um, in the presentation. But those are the three main written communications that we, that we issue besides the financial statements and the, the single audit or federal grant. Um, audit. So with that, I'll pause and see if there's any questions before we go through some of the financial results of the city and county. Yes, counselor, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I, I think I recall reading a story a, a few months ago about IHA and they were having significant issues uh, with the role of that organization really being uh, uh, they, they focus a lot on, on some of Indianapolis' most vulnerable populations. Um, did the audit find anything that could be acts of remediation that they need to be proceeding with? So yeah, I'll jump in and Andy can maybe chime in too. So that audit report for IHA did include several single audit findings related to the grant expenditures. Um, they are a significant um, user of HUD funds, as you're probably aware, and, and there were some findings related to their use of HUD funds, specifically Section 8 housing vouchers and so forth. Um, they, they do have a number of, of federal grant findings that were reported this year and, um, and will need to be corrected, and there's corrective action plans included in that auditor's report, which is publicly available as well. So, 
Andy, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add. Yeah, I mean, the only, there were a number of findings and, and probably not surprisingly. I mean, we had communications for probably the last oh, 60 days. Um, just how's the audit going? What do you need help with? Is there, the state board chimed in and, and we're trying to provide assistance. A lot of folks are just trying to help them um, get to the end goal of, of wrapping up the fiscal year. And they did have a lot of, a handful of findings. They had a lot of turnover, which is probably um, at, at least alluded to in a lot of their comments that, that a lot of the issues or, or findings were the result of just personality didn't have the right personnel in the right, right places on the, on the bus. Um, so again, as, as Rick mentioned, it's a public document. We got it 24, 48 hours ago, um, and we're certainly able to share that with you all. It's, again, published on, on the state board's website at some point, and they file directly with the feds, but um, there are some issues we'll need to deal with. Okay, thank you. For, you know, even just getting that report that late is concerning to me, right? I mean, just whatever those reasonings might have been to create it, to, to delay it so long is in itself a concern on top of the known concern. So I appreciate you, you touching on the subject that, that you have. Yeah, just as a follow-up, you have no responsibility under the city or county single audits to pursue the single audit of the IHA any further. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. So if you looked at our opinions in the single audit reports, we basically say there's X dollars of federal spend that, that IHA had, that are, and those findings are not included. So if you wanted to see them, you need to go get the, the IHA, but you're exactly correct. Yeah, I have a question too, and, and I know you don't do that audit, right? So, but curious if you all have a sense of whether the challenges are with regard to the organization or is it the audits team and audit staff that's performing? That audit, or do you have any sense around what their challenges are with regard to the engagement? Uh, you know, my my assessment based on discussions with the auditor and specifically that audit team is that their turnover has been a tr significant challenge for the organization, and and so I I get the sense that the delays from this year were more IHA staffing problems. Um, one of the challenges is obviously when you're administering $65 million of federal grant funds and you have significant turnover in various leadership positions, and I think the, the partner from the audit firm that did that work identified four to five leadership positions, including executive director, COO, CFO, controller, and so forth, that are critical to an audit process, and those positions all turn over in the last 12 to 18 months. Um, you have new people trying to step in and keep the, the ball rolling downhill, and I think they just hit some bumps as they were trying to get that audit done. So it, it sounds like, based on our discussions, that it was more on IHA staff because of the significant turnover and them trying to pick up what was left behind. Very good discussion. Thank you for that. Um, a couple of, couple of thoughts that I have hearing this discussion. One would be, um, if you would, when, when the electronic copy of the Indianapolis Marion County um, annual comprehensive financial report comes out, if you would, in, um, could you also include a copy of the IHA report to the members as well, so we have a copy of that as well. And, and, I, and then if, if you could look into Director Glass, the opportunity to have um, KSM come to the October meeting and, and kind of present to us, maybe present to us there the audit and, and talk to us and then maybe the committee members could have an opportunity then to talk directly to the audit team. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I agree, that's an uh, excellent idea and I appreciate Forbes's, um, uh, I know they just got it Wednesday so their uh, analysis is as much as they can provide but I think having their IHA's uh, external audit firm to come and answer uh, the committee's questions would be appropriate. So we will um, encourage them to uh, to do so at our October meeting. All right, Emily, continue. Well, and I'm actually going to pass it over to Caroline, who's going to go through some of the just high-level city financial results and trends that we saw um, this past year. All right, we're gonna pick up on slide 19, and over the next dozen slides or so, we're gonna focus, as Emily mentioned, specifically on the city of Indianapolis. We're gonna be looking at a lot of colors, a lot of numbers, so if you have any questions, feel free to raise those as we go along. So on slide 19, we're gonna take a, um, a depiction of the government-wide net position, 
And taking a look, you can see from 2020 to 2021, the net position of the city grew to 175 million. This is from a deficit of 8 million in 2020. There are three components to net position. The first component we're gonna look at is in blue there, the net investment in capital assets. And what that is, is just that. It is the investment in capital assets less any related debt. And so this really depicts any assets that are used to provide services to the citizens of the, the city. The next bucket we're gonna take a look at is that restricted section, which is in yellow at the very top that accounts for 573 million. That restricted portion of your net position is also just that restricted for external restrictions. So an example of that might be a, a grant agreement or some other external um, agreement outside of the city that those dollars are restricted for. And then the final component of net position is the unrestricted bucket, which is depicted in that lime green color. At the end of 2021, that amounted to $1.3 billion. And the reason that that was such a significant deficit is really due to two reasons. And it's due to the unfunded net pension liability that's recorded on the city's books of 752 million, and also the unfunded OPEB liability of 246 million. I would like to point out that that net pension liability that we just spoke about, that 752 million, 98% of that is actually paid by the state of Indiana for two pension plans that we call the pre-77 plans. So it's the old police and, and fire plans. And so although it's reflected as a liability on the city's books, it's not paid by the city. And then of the remaining deficit that relates to the OPEB balance or the other post-employment benefit balance, there's no intention by the city to, to fund this. There's no legal requirement to fund this. Um, what the city does comply with are annual payments that are um, required by labor agreements to, to beneficiaries of those plans. I'm gonna pause there. I, I'm assuming there'll be another slide that we can dig into the pension. And the there post. is, yes. Okay. And then I would just, for the viewing public, I'd make sure that they understand that these dollars are in thousands. And you said it correctly every time it was yes. in, in billions of dollars. But I just wanted to reinforce that for anyone in the public that was looking at this, that these dollars are in thousands. And I might add very quickly, you know, we, we look at, I'm going to step back. Governments are required to report in what's called dual perspective. So there's, in essence, two reporting models applied to governmental reporting. And, and so when we talk about government-wide, that is full accrual accounting that is similar to what a for-profit or, or not-for-profit business would account for. It's, it's full accrual. Everything, these pension obligations are fully accrued based on actuarial studies. These other post-employment benefit obligations are fully accrued based on these actuarial studies and so forth. Candidly, that's not really how cities and counties manage. And, and they really manage based on the fund financial statements, which is the other perspective which really looks at available resources and, and what available resources do we have to pay the, the obligations that we have. And so anytime you see government-wide, think full accrual, we'll talk about fund financial results as well um, and understand that government-wide is full accrual, but not necessarily how municipalities manage their operations. They really manage more on a fund basis that doesn't have these huge pension obligations and OPEB obligations included. So. Picking up on slide 20, uh, we're gonna take a look at the change in net position. So we're gonna look at the expenditures and revenues um, on the government-wide scale. And so taking a look at the, the far right there under 2021, there were expenses of 1.1 billion that were um, $182 million less than the 1.2 billion of programmatic and general revenues. And so because of that, you see that positive purple bar graph off to the far right, and that represents the, the increase to your net position in 2021. The expenses in 2021 increased from 2020 by $64 million, and over half of this represents um, the you know, change in pension expense, which is a result of those uh, assumptions used in the actuarial valuations. And then the other remaining part of that increase is really driven by the urban redevelopment and housing expenditures that occurred in 2021, and those related to funding received under the American Rescue Plan Act for rental assistance. And so the expense related to those dollars is included in there. Your revenues, so your blue and yellow, also increased $7.4 million, and this is attributable to an increase to property and then also local income tax.
And so those two kind of combined together results in that, that positive increase in purple. This is a great graph that actually illustrates um, the, the increases to your property and local income taxes. You can see your, your property taxes are uh, depicted here in the blue line and you can see there's an increase of $15 million there as we trend upward in 2021. Similar story on the local income tax line, which is that lime green line, an increase of $23 million. The local income tax uh, increase was really due to both organic growth and then also an increase in the supplemental distribution that was received by the city. And then the property tax increase can be attributable to growth in assessed values and then also a strong collection year. Here's another great uh, illustration, uh, again, that kind of draws into our, our previous conversation. This is an illustration of the assessed values by property type. So you can see the different colors represented in the bar graph by property type. And then you can see that increase to $15 million in the, the property tax revenue in that blue line that's drawn through, through the graph. And Caroline, if I could just make a comment really quick. Um, so we have continued to see really good growth and assessed values. Um, in 21 and also in 22, we're you know working on the 2023 budget right now, and we're continuing to see you know really historical um, assessed value growth, which is which is really positive. But even throughout the pandemic, I just want to point out that our property tax collection rates were really strong. Um, in 2020, after the onset of the pandemic, um, the governor passed um, you know property tax relief in terms of allowing um, homeowners to pay. Um, in July and push that due date back. But um, again, really strong collections in 2020 and 2021. Um, so I just wanted to let everybody know that we've uh, continued to see that. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Oh. Uh, hang on, Carolyn. Sarah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one quick question. <clears throat> when I'm looking at the graph, it shows in 2020, uh, 956 and then 948 in four in 2021, it looks as though there might be a mistake in those numbers. Is that possible? Did it go? Did our overall numbers go down, or did they go up? I don't. I I I think the label is misplaced. Is okay. on the little green bar at the very top. It's not. It's not for the blue line. So there's a little green. There's a little sliver of revenues. Okay. Or assessed value on yeah. the very top, and I think that's what the 956 and the 948 refers to, not okay. the blue line. That's Great. correct. I apologize for that. We'll correct that in the future. Nope, that's good. Thank yeah. you so Thanks, much. Sarah. Just a, a quick question. The assessed values, are those gross or net? I believe they're presented gross. Yes, that's yeah, correct. Okay. They're gross assessed value. Further questions? Okay, Carolyn. Okay, on slide 23, we're gonna take a look at the city's long-term debt portfolio. You can see from 2020 to 2021, there's not a significant difference. There is a $15 million reduction uh, in the, the portfolio there going from 2020 to 2021. In the general obligation portion of that portfolio, so that's depicted in the lime green, there was $36 million of GO bonds issued, so general obligation debt. And then the other significant items uh, depicted in this graph are in the tax increment revenue bonds portion uh, that's depicted by the blue. There were uh, refunded bonds, specifically the 2011A bonds were refunded, which reduced debt service requirements by $10 million. And then also wanted to draw uh, to your attention in the purple portion of the graph, the notes payable and capital leases. There was $50 million in notes issued for stormwater projects, and so you'll see that depicted there. So any increases were really offset by normal debt service payments, and that's leading to the, the $15 million reduction from 2020 to 2021. Just to be clear, to make sure that um, we're interpreting this correctly, so these these are the um, principal outstanding balances on an annual basis for each of the types of of uh, financing of debt. Yeah. So this is the the long term obligation associated with that debt. Correct. Yes. Okay.
the long-awaited pension slide here on 24. Uh, so you'll, you'll see from this graph, um, the variances from 2020 to 2021 are really driven, again, by those actuarial assumptions that we keep alluding to. So you'll see from 2020 to 2021, um, the most significant change is in that green portion of the graph, which is depicting the police and fire 1977 plan, uh, that actually flipped to an asset this year. Um, so you'll see it on the, the left side of the 2021 chart. Um, the PERF portion is depicted in the, the purple, so you can see that liability decreasing. Um, the PERF plan is 83% funded and the Police and Fire 1977 plan is 96% funded. And then the, the two uh, most uh, dominant portions of the chart here relate to the pre-77 plans, and those are the two plans that are um, paid by the state of Indiana that we, we re referenced earlier. Yeah, and if I could just add, so out of the total net pension obligation, 98% of that is that pre-77 that is really covered by the state of Indiana, so we are in a really good position in terms of being very well funded um, for our pensions um, with the city of Indianapolis. Okay, picking up on slide 25 here. So we're gonna be moving away from the government-wide focus and we're gonna be looking at the, the fund balances, so the government fund statements. And as Rick mentioned, these are really uh, a good depiction of available what's available for spending. So they're more on the short-term focus. And you can see from the, the graph here that we had increases to the general fund and then also the other non-major funds in 2021, and we had a decrease to the fund balance in the revenue bond debt service fund. The decrease there is due to transfers out to fund eligible tax increment projects. So that is depicted in that middle portion of the graph there. And then most of the increases on the right side for the total all other governmental funds portion, that relates actually to a, a, a particular fund that was included um, as a major fund in 2020. And what I mean by that is that it was reported separately. And in 2021, the balances were not material enough for it to be reported separately, and so it is included in that other non-major uh, fund section there on the right. Would these, would these uh, fund balances include um, federal dollars that are yep, on yep, hand if, as if, well? Yes, correct. So taking a look at slide 26, these are the revenue trends of the general fund specifically. And so the revenues of the general fund from 2020 to 2021 increased $52 million. That is predominantly from the, the taxes portion of this graph, so the green portion, and then also the intergovernmental revenue, so that's depicted in the yellow bar graph. Uh, the taxes, again, were driven by those increased property and income taxes that we spoke about on the government-wide side. And then the intergovernmental revenues uh, increased really from from twofold reasons. Uh, the first, there were some additional state revenues specifically related to the gas tax that were uh, accumulated in 2021. And then also we had some funds received and set aside for the Community Justice Campus Project or the CJC Project, and those are depicted in the yellow intergovernmental revenues as well. This is the opposite side of the general fund, so this is taking a look at the expenditures. From 2020 to 2021, uh, there was an increase of 99 million uh, in expenditures in the general fund. And this really related to, to two of these particular portions of the graph. So uh, first we're gonna take a look at the public safety expenditures, which are the blue, the blue portion of the, the graph there. There was a $56 million increase uh, in the public safety expenditures from 2020 to 2021. And this actually related to 56, million dollars that were moved from the coronavirus relief fund in 2020. So if you look at the 2019, uh, you can see it was actually higher and then we dropped down in 2020 and then we're back up in 2021. So some of those salaries were, um, were alleviated by the coronavirus relief fund in 2020 and so we're back to um, what we saw at 2019 levels. There also was an increase to the capital outlays portion, which is the gray portion um, of this depiction, and there was a $27 million increase attributable to transportation projects in 2021 that is reflected there. 
is it fair to say, uh, Carolyn, that uh, public safety predominantly is the IMPD and IFD, and then beyond that, it's predominantly salaries? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Janae, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, that is absolutely correct. So public safety, that's, that's mainly IMPD and IFD, and, and you're correct, it is, it is salaries. And then taking those last two slides that we looked at, this kind of um, you know, combines the two of them to put your revenues and expenditures together. And, and when doing so, uh, you can see that the net change in fund balance, which is depicted in purple there, is positive this year by uh, 27 million. And this again is specifically for the general fund. On slide 29, this is a depiction of the general fund balance. The fund balance is made up of four separate parts. So the fund balance can be restricted, committed, assigned, or unassigned. I'd like to uh, spend most of our time talking about that unassigned bucket, which is the orange tan color there. The uh, unassigned, uh, the unassigned balance uh, makes up 17% of expenditures and transfers out of the general fund in 2021, whereas in 2023 it made up 23%. Um, so this can be attributable to an increasing expenditures that we just noted. Uh, but the total fund balance overall increased by $27 million or 7% in the general fund. And if I could just uh, make a couple comments. So back in 2016, the City County Council passed a fund balance policy for the city. So we are to maintain at least 10% of an unassigned fund balance, that 10% is based on our expenditures. And then on the unrestricted side of fund balance, we are to maintain 17% in accordance with that policy. And since 2016, we've done a very good job of maintaining, um, you know, in, in addition to the, the policy threshold. And this is something that we always uh, talk to the credit rating agencies about. So it's something that's very important to them when they're, you're, you know, analyzing our credit um, rating. And then finally, wrapping up here with the, the city trends, uh, we have a depiction of capital, excuse me, per capita income versus unemployment. And you can see the per capita personal income held pretty flat from 20 to 2021. And then you can see the, the dive in unemployment driven down by economic factors there in that blue, blue line. And so with that, that concludes our review of the, the city financial results. Does anyone have any questions? Um, regarding the city before we move on to the county. Okay, great. Well, I'll go ahead and dive into the county. Um, we're going to see really consist similar graphs here just representing the county results now instead of the city results. Um, so if we look at this first graph here, this is going to look at the overall government-wide net position. So as Rick mentioned earlier, um, this includes all of the assets and all of the liabilities uh, of the county. So holistically looks at everything that is out there. Um, I wanted to point out a couple things here, and as you'll notice on the county, a lot of the fluctuations or reasons for changes are going to be a result of the um, Community Justice Campus or the CJC. Um, so you'll hear me reference that probably quite a bit um, as we go through these graphs on the county side. So first on that blue line, that net investment in capital assets, um, just wanted to point out that you will see that decrease from 2020 to 2021. Um, due to the fact that during 2021, this was the, the final year, the final kind of recognition of all of that lease liability for the CJC. Um, construction was pretty much substantially complete um, relating to the lease during 2021. So a lot, pretty much all of that lease liability now is recognized in the county financial statements, really bringing that net investment and capital asset balance down as that liability nets against the capital assets that are recorded on the county side. Um, your restricted balance, you will see an increase um, there, and an increase is really due to some statutory restricted balances that were received this year. And then on that green bar, your unrestricted amount, you do have a deficit on your unrestricted balance here. Um, this is really going to be driven from the pension liabilities that the county has. And so we'll have a slide here that shows what those pension liabilities are for the county um, here in just a little bit. For the viewing public, I would point out and, and that on, we've now shifted to where the uh, 
uh, dollars are not in thousands of dollars. So yes. these are in um, these are in normal yes. natural dollars. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate it. Okay, next, if we look here, you're gonna see the government-wide change in net position. So this is really going to look at what were those revenues and expenses and overall kind of net in, net change um, in operations for the year. So that blue bar is going to be your expenditures for the year. Um, if you notice from 2017 to 2018, both of those were at lower levels. When you get to 2019, you'll see that jump, um, 2019, 2020, and 2021. One um, really due, due to an overall increase in expenditures um, associated with some of the, the construction of the community justice campus. And then overall led to, we did have a loss this year of $9 million, which is really driven to more funds. That's that really small purple bar on the far right side here, you'll see a loss there. Um, that's really going to be due to the fact that the, the funds from the lease did run out, so the, the county was fronting uh, more of some of the costs to complete uh, the courthouse at the CJC and some other costs associated with the CJC facility. Yeah, and a lot of those costs were always planned to be covered um, by the, you know, the city or county. So we're talking about uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, and IT related. You know, those are things that we did not want to put on the bonds because the useful life is less than you know the bonds that are going to be outstanding. So that was always planned that we would you know be covering a, a portion of the of those costs as we got closer to completion of those facilities. Then if we look at the next slide, here you're going to see the tax revenues by type. Um, the blue bar is going to make up the majority of the tax revenue that, you're, that the county is receiving, which is your property taxes. And as you'll see there, there's been pretty much a steady increase if we look at the past five years. Um, your local income taxes are gonna make up the next or that green bar, and then the, the yellow is just going to be an accumulation of all the other taxes that are out there. And then we look at slide 35, here's where you're really going to also see on the county side that the assessed values by property type um, are increasing each year um, with the residential and commercial properties, the, the yellow and the, the burnt orange color making up the vast majority of your assessed values for your property. Then if we look at the next slide, page 36, Here's where you're going to see the net pension liability for the county side. So the county has three pension plans. Um, they also, the first is that blue, I'll talk first the blue bar. So out to the, the right side is going to be the PERF plan um, or the pension plan for the civilian employees. Um, you will see that that balance did decrease quite substantially this year. It was around um, 70 million, and so this slide is in the thousands again, 70 million last year, and then this year it's just under 30 million. That's really, that change is really driven by the actuarial assumptions used in that evaluation, um, and investments did well um, over that time period where the actuarial evaluation was performed, really driving that, that liability balance down. The other plan that the county has, so that's gonna be on the left side of the graph, um, is going to be the sheriff retirement and disability. The retirement is going to make up the majority of that balance because the green bar is very small in there, but it is in there. Um, but you'll see the sheriff retirement is making up the majority of that balance. Um, this is funded by the county, so we do not have a situation like we did on the city side. All of these pension plans are funded um, by the county and they are responsible fully for these plans. And I would just like to point out that on the sheriff's side, those are both closed plans, so there are no new participa uh, participants joining those plans. And in total, uh, let's see, the retirement plan is about 85% funded, and the disability plan is 99% funded, and then on the PERF side, which is that civilian pension piece, it's 92% funded. So again, well-funded pensions on the county side as well. Okay, so now if we look at the next page, page 37, this is, this is where we're gonna move on to the fund focus. So as a reminder, this is more looking at the current assets or current liabilities um, that are out there and not focusing on the long-term assets or capital assets or long-term liabilities like the leases that the county might have. On the far left side, you're going to see these are the, this is the um, general fund, so that has your core operations in there. 
Um, you'll see it's steadily been increasing until um, this year where it did drop down to just under $45 million. As we mentioned earlier, this is really going to be due to additional expenditures relating to the CJC that were budgeted for and expected for um, in the current year. So that's really what's driving that, that fund balance down this year. You'll also see the Public Safety Income Tax Fund, um, which is our other major fund that has to be reported separately in the financial statements. Um, you will see an increase in the fund balance there just due to additional um, tax allocations coming into that fund. And then last on the far right side is going to be the total of all the other governmental funds um, consistently that's been pretty um, consistent the past four years if you look at those four bars. Um, we did have an increase this year just due to overall increased revenue within those other um, governmental funds. If we look at the next page here, we're just going to be focusing on the general fund um, and the different revenue types that are flowing through that. By far, the green bar is going to make up the majority of the revenue that you're receiving in the general fund, and that is your tax revenue. Um, so again, you will see a slight uptick in the revenue um, if we look at from 2020 to 2021. Next slide here is your general fund expenditure trends. So here I really wanna focus on that purple bar or your capital outlays, because um, you'll see that that has the largest fluctuations if we look over the past five years. Um, so with this, what's causing that fluctuation, if you remember in 2019, that is when construction started for the CJC facility. So there was capital outlays that were recognized um, during that year as a result of the lease starting and you recognizing some of those assets for those that were put into place. So you'll see uh, $103 million was included in that purple bar in 2019 and then that was significantly higher last year in 2020 as a large amount of work was completed and then in 2021 kind of finished that out where some more capital outlays were flowing through. So that, that purple bar is really fluctuating just due to those additional expenditures being recognized for that CJC capital lease. Slide 40 is going to basically take all of those buckets, so your, your revenue, your expenditures for the, the general fund, um, your other financing sources and uses, and then look at the overall net change in fund balance and that small purple bar um, on the far right. So you'll see that overall, if we take the your expenditure level, you'll see that kind of drop off from 2020 to 2021 due to just a slightly less capital outlays for the CJC in this year. That blue and yellow bar are going to make up the, the total revenues or other financing sources that came in. You will notice that that yellow bar really helps offset a lot of those ex additional capital outlay expenditures that are coming in, and that is because of the recognition of the capital lease. So at the same time that we're recording those capital outlays for the CJC facility, we also have an offsetting um, other financing source that is coming in um, relating to the capital lease that is offsetting those expenditures. So that's why you're not seeing kind of a large difference between the expense side and the, re uh, the revenues and other financing sources side. And then we did have a, a net loss um, in the current year, if you look at the net change in fund balance, so that purple bar on the far right of just under $17 million. Then if we look at slide 41, our last slide on the financial results is going to be your general fund breakdown and looking at the different balances that make up the general fund. Um, here, if we look, you'll notice that the committed, so that green bar, um, we did have a balance in 2019 and 2020. This did drop off in 2021. Those funds were committed for construction of the CJC, so those were used this year. Um, so that's why you no longer see that balance in green for 2021 on the far right. The red balance and restricted, you'll see that that popped up here in 2019 and is still held through through 2021. That is restricted for once you start making your lease payments um, at the CJC, you'll be able to use those funds as they're restricted for um, lease payments there. 
And then lastly, I wanted to just point out here the, the unassigned or the, the yellow yellowish color on the, the far right side. So that's going to be the fund balance that is currently unassigned and that the county um, can allocate um, how they see appropriately. So again, a positive, positive balance there. So do wanna pause there. Any other questions on the county financial results before we kind of dive into some of the the information that was included in the management letter or internal control letters. If I could just make a, a comment, I know we've talked a lot about the CJC while we were going over uh, the county's results. And so the, the buildings out at the community justice campus, specifically the courthouse and the adult detention center were substantially complete at the end of 21. And then of course there was the grand opening, um, you know, just recently in May. And so now everybody is over there and the courts are moved in. Uh, lease payments did begin in January of 22. So we've been making monthly lease payments um, to the building authority for those facilities. Okay, great, thanks, Janae. Well, I'll go ahead and get started on the, the next section here, um, as long as there's no questions. Um, so this first slide here is the management letters. So the management letter is really going to cover um, those items that we've identified during our audit process that are, are not findings, so they're not internal control related matters. They are just recommendations or suggestions that we found um, when we were completing the audit process that we've communicated um, to management. So we just have two items that were listed in the letter here. The first is the accounting policies and procedures manual, um, which we've had on here for, for a number of years, but I'd like to mention that the city and county has been in the process of working on this. However, it's a, it's a large undertaking to pull together all that information and document all of those policies and procedures. Um, and so they do expect to have it completed here sometime in 2022. Um, but they are, I do wanna mention that they are working through it and, and do plan to get that done. But as you can imagine, um, it does take a lot of time and resources to pull that, that information together. Then the second one here is the fraud hotline. So really our comment or, or recommendation around that is that there's no formal policies or procedures surrounding um, the tracking or resolution of calls right now. And so our recommendation really is just to develop a formalized policy um, around the fraud hotline and receiving those calls and the ultimate resolution of those calls. The next page here, 43, um, we also included in the management letter those accounting, future accounting standards that will be applicable to the city and the county. The first three on this list are really the ones that are going to be effective to, for the city and county in 2022, so this next fiscal year. Um, the leases one is probably the, the biggest one we'd wanna point your attention to um, as it could potentially have a larger impact on either the city or county just depending on the, the number of leases that are currently out there. Um, so this standard is basically going to have you evaluate all of your leases and pools a lot of leases that were previously considered operating leases, so just would have been recorded as expense when they were incurred. It pulls those onto the books of the financial or onto the books of the city or county as an asset or liability. Um, and one thing that GASB has done a little bit different is you have to look at the lessor as well as the leasee side. So you have to look at both sides of that arrangement, not just the lessee side. Um, so again, that's going to, it, it just takes a lot of work to accumulate all the leases that are out there and make sure you have a full population to address that, that standard. Um, then there's also the conduit debt obligations, new standard that will take some additional time, especially on the city side to evaluate those. It really is just going to clarify the definition of what a conduit debt is, as well as um, adding some additional disclosures around that and really making it simplified across kind of all of the governmental entities out there and a standard definition for that. And then I won't go through the, the rest of the standards, but those are probably the two that I point your attention to as being the most significant for this next year. Okay, page 44 is going to look at the city internal control letter. Um, so for internal control matters, there's three levels of findings that we have. The first highest level of finding would be a material weakness. And so that would be required to be reported as one of those reportable findings that I talked about at, at the beginning. If you remember when we looked at the audit results tab, um, a material weakness would have to be included in that single audit report or that audit of your federal expenditures. The next one below that is going to be a significant deficiency. That is also required to be reported in that single audit or, or uniform guidance report. 
And then the lowest level finding that we have is a deficiency. Um, that is not required to be reported anywhere in the single audit or federal grant report um, and is only included in this internal control letter that does go to, to management and obviously the committee. So we did have a couple of, of findings that were communicated in this letter as well as some items that were identified as verbal deficiencies. Um, the two that were included in there for written letters on the city side relating to some additional payroll controls and tight, tightening up some of the controls surrounding payroll um, and relating to uh, pension, relating to some pension individuals as well. And then the second one was some I, items relating to IT, so user access review policy as well as review of IT security policies. Um, but again, I want to highlight here that the city did not have any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies, which is um, the first year in a number of years where we have not had any reportable findings. So really want to commend the city for, for cleaning up some of the areas where we've had issues or reportable findings in the past and not having any results this year. So that's a, that's a great achievement there on the city side. Okay. Then on the county side, we want to look here at the findings that we have. So we did, we had no material weaknesses on the county side, so that is great news, nothing that rose to that highest level of finding. We did have two significant deficiencies. So the first one relates to an adjustment to record a payable in the sheriff pension plan fund. Um, so an additional, that relates to that adjustment that we talked about earlier. Um, so that was our first significant deficiency that's included in here. Um, the second one relates to certain funds that are not maintained in the PeopleSoft accounting system. This is a significant deficiency that we've had for a couple years. Um, there are statutory requirements that require these funds that are not maintained in PeopleSoft to be maintained in, in separate ledgers. Um, so they are following the statutory requirements that are, that are out there for those funds. Um, however, our recommendation is really around incorporating additional procedures to periodically include those balances within the PeopleSoft, PeopleSoft system um, and review those on a periodic basis. So that's really kind of where our, our finding um, is surrounding that, is to pulling those in periodically and reviewing those on a periodic basis. Which are the funds that you're referring to? Yes, so it is going to be the, sh the sheriff commissary, um, the clerk funds, and the sheriff custodial funds that are the three that are not included in the PeopleSoft system currently. But, but to be clear, it, it is, <clears throat> I think you stated this, I just want to make sure that I understood you correctly, that uh, statutory requirements are being followed. Yes, that those are maintained and separate, kind of separate from the rest of the books of the county. So they are following that, those requirements. And our recommendation is really around just taking that information periodically and incorporating it into the PeopleSoft system, whether that be on a quarterly basis or, yeah. And, and, the, and the funds are included in the um, financial report. Yes, yep, that is correct. So they are pulled it's into just, the financial statements. It's just statements. not being brought into the accounting enterprise system. accounting system. Yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Emily, quickly, uh, so the sheriff funds, hey, <laughs> um, it, did you say the commissary funds? Yes. So is that like, you know, stuff that detainees buy in jail? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Maybe real quick, Dave, just to elaborate on, on, on your comment, the, because the, the, the county does follow statutory, they're, they're not, uh, going against what they're required to do. Our concern really is the, the oversight and the control process. So the, the, the certain funds don't follow the controls that, that you've set and are, are much more rigorous um, for, for all of your other funds that f flow through um, OFM. So uh, historically the recommendation is if you pull them in and look at it quarterly or look at it periodically and, and subject them to some of the, uh, the oversight that the rest of the county is subject to um, is really our concern is that Oftentimes when we have adjustments, it's in those funds just because they don't have quite the wherewithal and don't have the, the control structure that all your other funds do. So um, whether you bring it in probably isn't the key part, but, but developing some additional oversight. So maybe the easiest way is to bring it into PeopleSoft and subjecting, subjecting it to, to, to some of those review processes and approvals and things like that. But um, again, you're exactly right. that they're, they're not doing anything against statute or ordinance. But, And then the last bullet on this page is we did have two um, deficiencies. 
that were just included into the internal control letter. So again, those are not, the deficiencies are not reportable findings anywhere. Um, they're just included in the internal control letter. And similarly here, we did have the same comments regarding um, I, IT items, so the user access review policy and the review of IT security policies that we did on the city side. So again, consistent there, as well as having a, a conflict of duty I, or, um, in the cash disbursements cycle on the, the sheriff commissary area. So just again, two low level deficiencies included in the letter on the county side. Okay, so I wanna pause there and see if there's any other questions before Willie dives into some of the single audit results. Okay, great. Thank you, Emily. Um, sorry, no pretty bars and graphs here, but uh, this is focused on the single audit results, and what single audit is is just uh, auditing of uh, programs that are funded with federal funds to uh, achieve a specific policy objective. Um, so the city was a, a high-risk oddity for 2021 as a result of uh, material weakness or and or noncompliance. Uh, in prior years, uh, so 20, 2020 and 2019. Um, that basically means is that we just have to expand our uh, coverage to get more comfortable um, when we issue a, a statement, a final um, a statement. Um, this year, there were five major programs audited in 2021, um, which is two more than the three we issue, um, audited in 2020. Um, the scheduled expenditure of financial awards covered 194 million, I'm gonna round up, which is slightly below what was done in 2020. Um, that was mainly result because the uh, Corona Relief Fund, Coronavirus Relief Fund was not uh, a major program this year. Um, however, uh, two other Corona funds um, were added to this year uh, from last year. Um, so the CRF fund, coronavirus relief fund from last year was 170 million. The two um, supplemental or other coronavirus funds this year were only 140 million. So there's a, a little bit uh, drop off there. The great news, um, no internal control over compliance findings were reported. No instances of non-compliance required um, are, were required to report it. And uh, I must say that, as with every year, um, I've always had really great relationships with and, and assistance with um, the staff covering the grants. Uh, so my appreciation to Janine Sweezy, Deborah Hall, and uh, Janae Rorton um, to, to help out with testing and everything. It makes it go really smoothly. And with that, uh, the five funds that we covered are on the next slide, um, and I won't go through them all. But um, then we'll switch it to Sarah. She can cover the, the county uh, single audit. Thanks, Willie. So um, for the county single audit, we do do a separate single audit for the city and the county. Um, the county also was considered a high-risk auditee for 2021 due to prior year findings. Um, as Willie mentioned, the only bearing that has on the audit is that we have to have a different amount of coverage of testing. Um, so 40% coverage of testing versus 20%. Um, you'll, you can see on the next slide that we had well above that 40% coverage um, for both the city and the county. We had three major programs in 2021 for the county that um, is one more than 2020. We only tested two in the prior year. The schedule of expenditures was $9.8 million, which is a 47% de decrease over prior year. Um, that's mostly because there wasn't as much funds passed to the county from the city, um, mostly coronavirus funds. So Willie mentioned it, but um, last year the county received a lot of co coronavirus relief fund dollars from the city. This year, a lot of the coronavirus dollars were actually emergency rental assistance and the state and local fiscal recovery, but a lot of those funds stayed with the city instead of being passed to the county. So that's what makes up that large decrease over the previous year. We're happy to report for the county as well that there were no internal control over compliance findings and no instances of non-compliance that would be required to be reported. And along with the city, um, we did receive very good assistance from the county staff. It's mostly the same individuals um, that help us, but it's a lot of teamwork across different departments um, that helps us to get the audit issued. So thank you to that team. 
On the next slide, it shows the three different funds that we audited this year, which were the Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding Program, the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, and then Child Support Enforcement. So those first two grants that we audited were specific COVID dollars that were received. Um, all of the opinions issued were unmodified, so that's exactly what you would want to see. And we had 61% coverage, so that's well above that 40% threshold that we needed to hit for the county. So this last slide, um, we just want to, again, we've done it throughout our presentation. I think everybody hit on acknowledging all of the people that help us to get the audits completed. We've listed out um, a number of offices, including the mayor's office, OFM, the auditor's office, county treasurer. Um, all of us helped us, helped us very well throughout the whole audit process for the financial statement audit and the single audit as well. Um, OAP, or the Office of Audit and Performance, provided 388 hours and helped us complete testing throughout the audit process. Um, thank you to that team for all of their help. And Willie from Thomas and Reed helped us as well um, and had 317 hours that contributed to completing the audit this year. We also want to thank the audit committee for um, our, all of your help and listening to this presentation today. Um, if there are any questions, we're happy to take them at this time. The rest of the Presentation is the past adjustment schedules that we were not going to go through um, each item individually, but if there are questions, we can answer those. Thank you very much. Other, uh, Mr. Clater. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if, if I could, I apologize for backing up, but I just read the detail of this. On the, the uh, internal control letter on the county, uh, the segregation of duties uh, item on the commissary fund, is that a deficiency as opposed to a significant deficiency because of materiality? Um, so it, it is a deficiency, you are correct, um, but it's just as a deficiency because we've identified um, complementary controls that are in place to really keep it down at that deficiency level and for it not to rise above um, that just low level deficiency. So that's really what's leaving it down as the deficiency level instead of for it rising up is that there's some other compensating controls that help kind of balance out um, what, is in what is currently what we've identified as a conflict. Okay, thank you. I think I would have questioned that as well. And, and it might be just the, the way that it was written. Don't you agree, Mike, that it, it says there's a single payer that has the control over the, the entire uh, fund. And so that might have raised, raised the same questions as well instead of there were internal, internal controls. <laughs> Other questions? Does that conclude your report? Well, I, I too would like to thank everyone for uh, their hard work in this uh, endeavor. This is um, once again a very successful um, endeavor this year again. So I congratulate everybody on getting um, things done on time and, and um, with such great results. And so from OFM, thank you. OAP, thank you. Um, Madam Auditor and Madam Treasurer's office. I don't see the treasurer here, but uh, thank you all for, for your work and efforts. And um, we look forward to um, gearing up for next year. So with that, I believe I'm handing off then to Director Glass for an update on the uh, Office of Audit and Performance. Hi, good morning, everyone. And uh, just to echo the chairman, thank you to four of us, Thomas and Reed, um, OFM, Janae and her great team, um, and also the uh, auditor and, and treasurer's office. Um, I want to also want to thank uh, from our office uh, our audit manager Cola uh, Akintola, who is uh, responsible for all 388 hours uh, that we contributed to the audit. Um, he is out sick. I don't know if those two things are related, uh, but uh, we wish him a speedy recovery and thank him for his his great work there. Um, we uh, at introductions. Um, you might have noticed we have a new employee, uh, Tion Trice. Uh, there he is. Um, who joined us in May. Uh, Tian uh, joined our audit team, so we are now fully staffed uh, for, for the first time in my tenure, so we're very happy to uh, have Tian, who's been a great addition, has, has already brought some great ideas uh, to, uh, to our office. Um, a brief update on our 2022 audit plan. 
um, a couple of engagements that began uh, in calendar year 2021. Uh, the audit of the county election board, uh, which is led by uh, Dr. Dorothy Henry, uh, who I believe is also at, uh, out today. Um, we have uh, completed the report and received, uh, uh, we actually just received responses from uh, election board leadership. So that report will be finalized and distributed um, in, in the coming days. Um, HR um, has been led by uh, uh, Vanessa Mitchell. Um, we are uh, wrapping up field work and um, uh, are, are, is, have we comp completed field work on the HR audit? Okay, so we're close to completing field work on the HR audit. We're, we're, we're already drafting the report, and so um, we're, we're working to, uh, to complete that as well. Um, our first priority in terms of our new projects for 2022 is our BNS permitting engagement. Uh, field work is ongoing. Uh, we are uh, still set with our uh, target completion date of uh, Labor Day uh, of this year. Um, we expect to probably complete it before that, but, but uh, are committing to, a, to Labor Day completion. And our two other, uh, our, our two audit, new audit engagements for 2022 are the audits of uh, payroll um, for the city county, uh, as well as uh, real property assessment. And uh, those um, are just in the beginning stages and will have a completion date of uh, the end of calendar year uh, 2022. In terms of other engagements of our office, um, we are uh, we have an advisory services gauge, engagement with the Office of Public Health and Safety uh, regarding coordination among uh, community justice entities uh, regarding uh, gun safety and in interpersonal violence cases. Um, we've uh, kicked off that engagement and, and expect a completion by year's end, as well as uh, an advisory engagement with, with OFM on uh, agency level uh, internal controls, um, which we have not started yet, but it, expect to uh, in, in uh, the coming weeks and, and to also complete at, uh, at year's end. Uh, any questions about the annual plan update? Oh, sure, yeah, thank you. And uh, the chairman mentioned this as well. Um, so I think this was an, an error uh, in communication. We, we actually do have, a, of an, have an updated um, SOP regarding our uh, fraud awareness hotline um, that we'd be happy to share with the board um, and distribute to, to Forbes. Um, not sure how, uh, I'm sure it's, it's, it's uh, not sure that communication, miscommunication happened, but we'd be happy to, uh, to send that to you. So thanks, Wes, for bringing that up. Okay, um, Indy performs. Um, I have uh, a few quick agencies to thank um, for uh, participating in our uh, second session. Um, we were happy to have folks from the Office of Corporation Counsel, uh, the Indianapolis Fire Department, uh, the Coroner and Assessor's Office, OPHS, uh, Parks and Rec, as well as uh, DPW. Um, our uh, Performance and Innovation Manager, uh, Barry Reinhardt, who's back there, uh, as well as uh, Vivian Agnew and uh, Jack O'Tain, who's um, out in, in another engagement, have done great work. Um, we have uh, committed um, over 1,300 uh, training hours, um, trained uh, 15 city and county agencies, uh, working in 43 uh, different functional areas. Um, we are working on getting um, our uh, fancy Power BI dashboard, uh, measuring our progress in our Indy Performance Program um, to be public facing so we can uh, easily share with folks um, our progress in that area. Um, it's been very uh, excited to hear about uh, Barry and his team's continued progress. Um, so uh, would be happy to direct any questions to Barry about the Indy Performance Program. <laughs> Okay, I believe that's it for our uh, update. Um, we wanted to make it brief, uh, considering we are not uh, the main event today, but uh, happy to answer any questions uh, from the committee. All right, thank you, Director Glass. <clears throat> any other, any other follow-up questions <clears throat> from committee members? Uh, once again, I would remind uh, committee members that our next meeting is scheduled for uh, Friday, October 28th, uh, 2022 at 9 a.m. here at the CCB. And to watch for an email on the post-external audit, there will be a survey to come out for uh, 
members to, to fill out, so we would appreciate your participation. Any other closing comments from anyone? Rick? Yeah, very briefly, you know, at the very end of our presentation is our contact information. We covered a lot of material today, and I, and I know that, and, and appreciate your patience as we work through all that. If you are, as you walk away, if you think of a question, please don't hesitate to contact us. We're happy to entertain any questions that come up throughout the year. We want to make this as informative as possible. We give you a lot of information. It's a lot to digest in, in 45 minutes to 60 minutes. If you have anything that comes up after our presentation, please don't hesitate to reach out. It's got email and phone numbers for, for our entire team, and we're happy to entertain those questions. So, Thank you for that. That's good information. Please take advantage of that if you have any follow-up questions. And once again, I applaud everyone for their hard work um, getting this um, completed and uh, look forward to another um, certificate from GFOA. So. Uh, we'll keep our 40-plus-some um, years of, uh, of GFOA excellence on, intact here, so I appreciate that. Um, anything else? With that, I will entertain a motion for adjournment. Move for adjournment. Is there a second? A second. Very well. Can I take that by consent, counsel? He's not looking at me, so consent. <laughs> Have a good day. So the back part of it like breaks out all that into all